Hi, OK, welcome. Um, I might at some point get a stool and like come sit closer with you. So this, yeah, um, maybe, that, maybe that might make sense. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start standing, and then we'll see if that just feels too weird, and then, and then I'll come and sit down. Um, OK, so the idea is uh, I'm a local artist, and I'm coming here to talk about my practice. And, and putting it in the context of one of the works that's on display. And so um, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I, I'm an experimental theater artist, mainly. And, and um, I work in theater in a bunch of different ways, uh, mostly uh, as a writer, but also as a director and just sort of a maker of theater pieces. Um, and I've been trained as a playwright. And I work now as an academic. Um, and so I'm. I'm some of the influence on the things that I'm going to say come out of my, uh, my time spent in the academy, sadly. Uh, but, but maybe I'm hoping less so. I'm really trying to provide kind of more of a free form ramble than um, uh, something that's sort of rigorous and scholarly. So we'll see. Uh, maybe it'll just be just a ramble. OK. Um, and, and, and I just want to continue by saying that I'm not, I'm not a visual artist, and I'm not an art historian. Uh, and so um, the inaccuracies may abound in what I have to say, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and so yeah, my, my, but my interest does, I am very interested in the overlap between theatrical practice and visual art. Um, and, and what I'm really in particular interested in um, is uh, what the work that contemporary artists are making um, that happens in galleries, or happens in museums, or happens out in the world um, might have to offer uh, for me as a theater artist in thinking about uh, especially form. Um, and so that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. And how um, those formal ideas might shift the frame of reception and production in theater um, in a way that would make theater more interesting for me, personally, as a theater goer um, and also as a theater artist. Um, so uh, and I'm, I guess I'm also interested in how to make theater pieces that reach audiences that are not necessarily audiences that are traditionally interested in theater. So maybe audiences that are interested in, interested in visual art or audiences that are interested in um, other contemporary uh, modes of expression um, more so than um, traditional theater. So, and I guess the last thing I would say about that is that the, I'm interested in how theater ideas or something about theater can happen outside of the theater proper. Um, how can we take, how can we make theater without theater? Uh, and if we did that, what does that mean? Um, there was an exhibition a few years back uh, in Barcelona that had that title, Theater Without Theater. Uh, and the idea was, what are these theatrical ideas that begin to take shape in other forms and outside of a, a traditional um, theatrical venue? So, uh, and I am going to get a stool, I think. And I'm going to sit, sit closer, if that's OK. Um, so I feel like this is a very intimate group, and it feels weird uh, to be quite so presentational. Um, uh, so, so I had a, um, I did this event at the City University of New York called After the Show a couple years ago. And um, I made it in collaboration with a friend of mine who's a visual arts producer. And we gathered a whole bunch of experimental theater makers and uh, scholars and theater critics. Um, and we asked them, um, what can we make that's not a show? Right? What are the ways that we can make theater that's not uh, subject to sort of the traditional protocols of making theater? Um, how could you make something that's uh, somehow still theater and at the same time is now a parade or an installation or uh, whatever? Um, and uh, we were asking this because we felt like here are all these um, experimental theater makers, and here I'm sort of uh, betraying my. Uh, base of operations, like where I came to be as an artist is in the sort of downtown theater scene in New York. So that's the world that I'm, that we were, that we were taking on, right? Um, and we were wondering, uh, my friend and I, why 
is all this experimental theater not really seem very experimental anymore, but rather seem like we've taken some ideas that became very popular in the late 60s and through the 70s and refined them and developed them uh, into sometimes really fantastic work, but it doesn't seem to be experimental in the same way or have the same um, experimental drive. And we were wondering, uh, why is that and what is currently unexamined in theater? Um, what are the sort of basic things that are being taken as given that maybe we don't have to take as a given? And, you know, in other words, there's a stage and you have tickets and it's probably shows at 8 or if you're in Portland, it's at 7.30. And, um, uh, you know, what are all these things and is it, are they necessary? Um, and we were wondering especially uh, if theater had ever had the kind of conceptual moment that happened in the visual arts in the late 60s and early 70s with the conceptualists? And is there something that theater could learn from or think about theater makers, practitioners, audiences, funders, institutions, could think about um, that we could draw from, the, from that movement, from, from conceptualism, even though in visual arts, conceptualism is considered to be this period of work that happened and it's over, and it, nonetheless, the legacy of conceptualism, right, is still with us in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, so what could happen in theater? Um, and what would happen if the expression of a piece, right, is driven by the concept, by the idea, rather than by the tools we happen to have around, like we happen to have a lighting designer and a sound designer and we have, and we have costumes and we have a theater. Um, and uh, so we made this, we made this conference and, and um, part of it was presenting work and all these artists presented proposals and did things and it was a lot of interesting stuff and if we have time, I will talk about some of those works in detail because they're really pretty fun. Um, uh, but I'm going I'm I'm to skip over that for now, and I'm just going to say uh, that the obvious counter-argument that you might be thinking or that some people might think is, like, why bother, right? I mean, um, if you're now making something that's not a show or maybe it's, and maybe it's not in a theater and it's in a gallery, um, what's the point of even thinking about it as theater anymore? I mean, people are, artists are making parades and artists are obviously making installations. Um, and, and so why, who cares? And, 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 and at that point, you sort of begin to ask, well, what is theater anyway? Um, and why hold on to that as a thing? Um, and so uh, is this just sort of like a conceptual game of words, or is there some kind of um, bearing this might have on actual practice and actual experience of art? Um, and uh, aren't we, in fact, in a sort of moment of uh, postmodern interdisciplinary melange anyway, and so who cares? Um, and uh, I'm not going to answer any of those questions, but I, I'm going to come back to them, and I want you to keep them in mind, right? Um, so, okay. So now, that's part one of my talk. It's already over. We've already made it to part two. Part two is looking at the solo wit. And, um, okay, so I'm, here's this print by Solowit, um, uh, all one, two, three, four, five, and six part combinations of six geometric figures. Um, and uh, right, so, and, and so these are all the, the, the ways you can organize them in, in by one, and then you have by two, right, and by three, and by four, and by five, and then there's only one way to do it by six. Because in this order doesn't matter, right? It's just a it's, it's, it's just which ones you've selected to put in the, in the grouping. Um, okay, so uh, I imagine you guys all know Solowit, and I'm gonna, but, but I'm gonna say some of this stuff anyway, which is that, uh, right, so Solowit really comes, his idea is he comes up with the idea for the piece instead of coming up with the expression of the piece. I mean, the idea is in the title, here are the ways you can arrange these shapes, these are the arrangement of the shapes. Um, and, uh, the whole um, conceptual turn in artistic practice, right, uh, is that the idea of the work is now the heart of the work, and the expression is something that can be done by anybody, or anybody who has the technical skills to do it. Um, and so mostly it's not done by Saul Lewitt himself, and, and one of the early effects of that, right, is that um, 
uh, his works could be executed around the world just by sending the instructions. Um, and he didn't have to go and he didn't have to send the pieces. He could just uh, send the instructions and they could be executed elsewhere. And so we have this kind of late 60s uh, preview of, um, I mean, this piece is from 1980, but the sort of the, the, the genesis of, of this idea is it comes in the late 60s. And you have this preview of, um, uh, the kind of the world that we live in now, where we, we send information around the world and it, we send it encoded and it becomes, and it's decoded and our computers watch it and we have, now we have the information. And, and, and so this whole idea is um, art is, he's condensed in some way into information and language. Um, and the concept somehow is bigger than the execution of the concept. Um, and so uh, one of the ideas, right, from, from some of the conceptualists, was this would bring about a democratiz de democratization of art, and now anybody can do it, and we would eliminate the cult of the artistic genius, and of course, uh, that didn't happen at all, uh, and, and instead, um, the question uh, becomes one not so different from copyright or patent, where suddenly the idea has, uh, has a monetary value, and, and that idea is represented and in the form of a certificate. And, um, and so like a, a genuine uh, LeWitt uh, drawing is, is, is um, uh, enabled to happen by, by the presence of the certificate, which now has the um, Walter Benjaminian aura that used to belong to the work has now been, is now put on this, this other fetish object of the certificate, right? Um, and uh, I grew up thinking about this, right, because in my uh, Mom's apartment, there's this big Saul LeWitt wall drawing. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, in Manhattan uh, on the Upper West Side in a rent controlled apartment that my mom still lives in. And there's still this big Saul LeWitt pencil drawing on the dining room wall, but it's decommissioned, it has no value. And, and when I was growing up, I was really, um, you know, it's the 80s, and I just wanted to know why this famous artwork had like no value. Uh, and um, so I was really interested in that. Uh, and I think that that's um, one of the things that got me thinking really early on about these questions uh, about instructions and procedures and the relationship between those things and, and the expression. She still has it, it's like chipping off. And she just like won't do anything about it. It's, you know, it's from like 1972. Uh, the person who lived in the apartment before her and of course, she can never leave. It's rent controlled. The apartment, the person who lived in the apartment before her, um, was an art dealer, and so he had it. He had it. He he owned the piece, and he had it uh, executed. And then when he moved, he took the certificate with him and had it executed somewhere else. And so it still exists in this, um, you know, nether space, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, one of the ideas here. Um, is that you somehow, for LeWitt in particular, right, the idea is you have a plan and you stick to it and you don't change once you're going, right? You have, the, as an artist, you like make the plan and then you do it. And you don't, um, if it's wrong, it doesn't matter, you just make a new plan and then you execute that plan. You don't change the plan midstream. Uh, and, and there's a way in which he thought that this would reduce uh, the interference of the rational mind in the creative process, um, and and he more than once he talks he's talked about his work uh, being mystical for that reason that somehow invokes some kind of other mystical thing and and um, that, that that gets lost when the rational mind is is involved in the expression of the work and so so here we're like in contact with um, something that actually is more than. Uh, just his invention, we're in contact with really these are the ways that you could arrange these shapes. So this exists outside of this work somehow, right? I mean, these are the only ways to do it. It's like a, there's a, a mathematical law happening. So, um, you know, uh, what what, what, for me as a theater artist, is the value of thinking about any of this stuff. Um, and uh, one thing is that, in a certain sense, LeWitt has turned visual art into literature here. I mean, there's a way in which 
uh, as, the, as the instructions become the important thing, uh, their recipes, uh, their ideas, um, and, and maybe th th that's where the art is, and maybe you can't see it in, unless it's expressed, but nonetheless, the, uh, the art is there in the idea, there's procedures, and in theater, we call those plays, right? Um, there's the text that we have, and then we do them. So uh, already we're working from uh, something that's kind of similar, and I sort of want to, uh, I don't know, claim Lewitt as a dramatist, I guess, you know, uh, and take him for playwriting. Um, because, you know, in a way, right, he, the execution of the instructions um, is, a, is a production, right? And so, so in a certain sense, we're kind of in a theater right now, and um, we're watching a production of this piece, um, but the production's not the play. And, and um, this, is just the, this is just the production of it. The play exists outside. And so it's very kind of platonic, right? I mean, there's this idea that there are these, there's a form of the, of the piece that's beyond the piece. Um, so this relationship between um, a text and then an execution of the text uh, is something that's really uh, important for me um, as somebody who's invested in questions about um, text and performance and experimental theater um, because it's fraught. Right, it's a fraught relationship, and uh, the traditional model, right, is that a playwright writes a play, and then um, there's an, the director directs an interpretation of that play, and and it probably deviates a lot more from the instructions than uh, Lewitt would be happy about, but nonetheless, like uh, that's the model, and and in experimental theater, right, or contemporary experimental theater, that relationship is different, um, and. Uh, as the, as the contemporary theater, as experimental theater has moved away from um, storytelling and more of an emphasis on uh, the sensory and aesthetic experience of being in a room and the light and the sound and the spectacle and whatever, the bodies, all those things become uh, an experience that you have, right? Um, that not always, but sometimes is not about story. Um, and it's usually not about a linear traditional storytelling model. Um, and, and so people call that um, post-dramatic theater, which is like a sort of unhappy phrase, but that that's, uh, has a lot of currency. And so there's this new relationship between text and performance, because no longer is there just a play and then you do the play. And so how is, how, what is the relationship in contemporary performance? Well, um, a lot of times it comes out of collaboration in the rehearsal room between the actors and the director, and um, sometimes it's created after the fact as a document of the performance. Um, sometimes the playwright and the director are the same person, it's an auteur, uh, and uh, they execute the whole thing, or there's no text, um, or the text is found text. Uh, we get a book of poetry, and that's the text, or we, um, take Moby Dick, uh, and that becomes the text of the piece, right? Um, so, uh, you know, when I talk about text, uh, I mean the spoken language that the actors are using on stage, but I also just mean all the text that tells you what the world of the play is, which is often defined in the script originally, traditional playwriting model, um, tells you something about the world. Um, I have a friend uh, uh, who, um, who is a, a playwright, and I was talking to her about some of this stuff, and she was saying, and she's a fairly traditional playwright, and she was saying, well, what I do, I think of as structure. I, I create the structure. The, I, sure, I write all the words that the actors say, but that's really not important. What's important is that I create the structure for the whole thing, and then other people come along and do the parts. Um, and uh, so, um, so this has got me thinking about these issues, and, and, and I guess in a way they seem like sort of minor problems. It's more interesting to have theater have moved in this direction, but they're less minor if you're an experimental playwright like myself, then they become sort of life and death questions that haunt you. Um, how do you interact with, uh, with this kind of theater? Um, and um, what are the possibilities 
for making writing, how can writing interact with production in an interesting way? Um, and that doesn't simply replicate the old dramaturgical structure uh, and also doesn't replicate the power structure, which is of the sort of playwright writes the play at the top, that's the sort of number one author, and then authorship moves down hierarchically from the playwright to the director to the actors. And then, uh, so how do you not replicate this power structure that upsets people, and how do you uh, make something um, that uh, engages with the sort of new ideas about how to make um, a world for people theatrically? Um, and so, uh, what kind of procedures could a playwright use or create or make um, that are geared for performance um, but make it function differently? And um, so, as a side note, I just wanted to throw this out that there's kind of an overlap historically, uh, almost an overlap between, between LeWitt and, and um, Happenings and Fluxus performance. Um, which also used um, uh, recipes uh, and uh, had often used instructions, although the results were usually not very precise executions of those. Sometimes they were, um, but they certainly weren't, didn't have this Lewitt level of precision. Uh, and then also, um, uh, sometimes I, they're theater and sometimes they were not theater. I mean, sometimes they, uh, they were theatrical performance and sometimes they were performance that was not theatrical. And, and uh, this sort of brings me back to why worry about the word theater and what is the distinction that I would make between theatrical performance and not theatrical performance? Why not just use performance, performance art, live art? We could just use a different word and give up on the theater. Um, and especially when these, we were making this work that doesn't have linear storytelling, or perhaps there's no storytelling at all, why, why, why? Um, and uh, so I have a reason for me, and it's just mine, um, but I'm gonna tell it to you, uh, which is that, um, so, so, so theater, as you, as, as you guys may know, right, comes from this Greek word theatron, which means seeing place. Um, and, and, and for me, I think of theater as a place for a certain kind of seeing, right? Um, and it's a place for seeing things that aren't true. That's the way that I think about it. So it's a seeing place, but it engenders a certain kind of looking at things where you know they're not true, which is a difference that I would draw between theater and performance. And um, when I think about how we talk about Dionysus being the patron god of Greek theater, um, you know, he's a god of revelry, but he's also a, a a trickster, right? And I think that um, theater, for me, is, is governed by tricks, by a trickster spirit. And um, it's not a medium, really. I mean, performance, if we're going to use the word medium, the medium is performance. But theater is the spirit of trickery that infuses it. It's, a, it's, it's lying, right? I mean, there's something fundamentally um, uh, uh, fraudulent about theater, which is what, to me, makes it interesting. Um, and so uh, I think that fraud fraudulence can happen with or without traditional storytelling. I think it's um, not, storytelling and fraudulence don't actually have to go together. Um, OK, so the question is then, um, oh, so I, this is the other thing. Is this is, these are some drawings by my daughter that got stapled in here by accident. So I just thought I'd share them. This one's good. Phoebe the movie. Okay, um, what are the what are the other um, so what are the things that 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 could be done and and, and I um, uh, I thought I would share with you great I thought I'd share with you a couple of my own pieces um, one's really old I wrote it like 15 years ago um, but I'm included I want to talk about it because it's um, highly algorithmic. Um, and then I'm going to read from the piece that I'm making right now uh, with the Portland Experimental Theater Ensemble, Pete. Um, and so that's the second thing I'm going to talk about. So the first thing um, is this play that I wrote a long time ago um, called Loaded Cowboy. Uh, and so here, I'll just, I'll just tell you what it says. Um, instead of, uh, it begins with, it starts with rules. And it says, one, there is a pit surrounded by an audience. 
Two, in the pit are 25 performers arranged as follows. And then there's sort of a grid, A1 through A5, B1 through B5, yeah. Each performer can be in any of the following states in each generation. So that you'll see the play comes in a sequence of generations. A, wearing a cowboy hat. B, pointing a gun. C, wearing a cowboy hat and pointing a gun. Or D, neither wearing a cowboy hat nor pointing a gun. Four, the initial state of each performer is determined by a chance operation. For example, the tossing of two coins. Five, the state of each performer for each subsequent generation is determined in the following way. A, each performer has a maximum of eight neighbors, right? So they're just the people that surround them. Um, and B, hats and guns are treated as two separate operations. C, if a performer is wearing a cowboy hat in one generation, he continues to wear it in the next generation. If he or she has two or three neighbors who also wear cowboy hats, if more than three or less than two neighbors also wear cowboy hats, he or she removes the hat for the next generation. D, if a performer is not wearing a hat in one generation, he or she wears one in the next if he or she has exactly three neighbors wearing hats. E, C and D all above also apply to guns. That is, if a performer is pointing a gun in one generation, he continues to point it in the next if he or she has two or three neighbors who also point guns, etc. cetera. Um, so the idea is uh, there are some more rules. That are, it gets more complicated. But the idea is um, there are all these rules governing the arrangement of hats and guns among the performers, right? Um, and, uh, and the algorithm that that's based on is, an, is, is the, this life computer program from the late 60s. Uh, so it's, it's actually um, very beautiful patterns actually turn out of, this, of that algorithm. It's, you can start with something very simple and then very interesting complicated patterns happen. Um, so anyway, then there are characters. And the characters are cowboy fish, who wears a cowboy hat and points a gun, Mrs. Fish, who points a gun, Dr. Gregory, who wears a cowboy hat, and a chorus of whispering dinosaurs who neither wear hats nor point guns. Um, Twelve, if there are no performers playing a, given character, playing a given character in a given generation, the lines remain unsaid. Um, and then there are a series of generations. I'll read, a, I'll read a couple of them. Mrs. Fish. Come out here, boy. Cowboy Fish, Mama, I can't right now. I'm busy with fever. Mrs. Fish, the doctor is here. Dinosaurs, doctor. Dr. Gregory, come on out, care cowboy. Cowboy Fish, all right. Dinosaurs, all right. <laughs> so that's the first generation. Generation two, Dr. Gregory, where'd you catch this fever, son? Cowboy Fish, doing my rounds. I've seen all kinds of ghosts. Dr. Gregory, ghosts? What sort of ghosts? Mrs. Fish, oh, don't ask him, he'll go on and on. Dr. Gregory, go on and tell me, cowboy. This is essential for diagnosis, Mrs. Fish. Mrs. Fish, all right. Dinosaurs, all right. So that's the second generation. Mrs. Fish, see, this is third. See, I told you, it's always dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are looking at me. The dinosaurs want to eat me, cowboy fish. It's true, Dr. Gregory. Dinosaurs did once roam the earth. Dinosaurs looking for food. Cowboy fish, I see them all the time. They have names they call each other. Generation four, Dr. Gregory, what do they say to you? Cowboy fish, I can't understand their language. Dinosaurs, grizzle, grizzle. Grizzle. Generation five. Mrs. Fish. I'm leaving this town. I'm looking for better things. You can take care of Cowboy and his dinosaurs. Cowboy Fish. Ma! Dr. Gregory. Let her go, Cowboy. Let her go. I'll take care of you. Dinosaurs. Grizzle. 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 Generation six. Mrs. Fish. Well, I'm back. Dr. Gregory. How come? Mrs. Fish. Turned out there was nowhere any better than here. Cowboy Fish. Well, I'm hungry. Dinosaurs. Make us some lunch. Generation seven, dinosaurs, how many years ago was it before there were all these piles of nothing? How many times did we call each other on the telephone? Cowboy Fish, mom, telephone, Mrs. Fish, who is it? Dr. Gregory, it's me, dinosaurs, hey, cowboy, what do you think? Hey, cowboy, what do you say? Cowboy Fish, what do you want? Generation eight, Dr. Gregory, the dinosaurs make me nervous. Mrs. Fish, what about cowboy? Cowboy Fish, what about me? Dinosaurs, what about cowboy? Generation nine, Dr. Gregory, the dinosaurs left. Mrs. Fish, that's right. 
Cowboy fish, they're all over the ranch. I see them. Dinosaurs, grizzle, grizzle, grizzle. Cowboy fish, I'm mostly bleeding. Dinosaurs, grizzle, grizzle, grizzle. Cowboy fish, I'm also nervous. Dr. Gregory, it's us versus them. All we can do is fight. You gotta draw fast, cowboy. Cowboy fish, they're coming back. Mrs. Fish, why? Cowboy fish, turned out there was nowhere any better than here. And then the next generation repeats until there's a stasis in the algorithm. Mrs. Fish and Dr. Gregory. Quick, boy, quick, you gotta be the fastest. Cowboy Fish, I'm doing my best. Dinosaurs, doing my best. Cowboy Fish, I see the dinosaurs and I see the dinosaurs and I see them eat my cattle, my girls. I know I gotta protect my girls, but I don't know how. I'm sweating and bedridden and sick. I'm purple and panting and old. I see the dinosaurs and I see the dinosaurs hiding behind buildings and under manholes and I'm still here and I'm still here and I'm still here. Dinosaurs, still here. Grizzle, 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 still here. Okay, that's the end of that play. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. I mean, except that you see it, and there are different people playing the characters based. The algorithms govern, govern the movement of props, really, and costume pieces. So different actors are playing the parts depending on what. In each generation, it's different people playing the parts. So it's difficult to follow. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and now I'm going to read from this, uh, this, this piece that I'm making right now. Um, and, and so one thing that I would point out about that piece, which is from a long time ago, is that uh, all those procedures really govern stuff that happens within the field of the stage. Um, and in this piece, it's not true. The procedures govern what happens in the field of the stage, but also what happens in rehearsal and also the relationship to the audience are all governed by uh, procedures. And so this is from um, this piece that I'm making with, with Pete. Uh, right now, and this is a draft. They haven't even seen this, so this, none of this may happen. Um, and, but it's called The Procedures for Saying No, is the name of the piece. All procedures can re be repeated any number of times with or without variation. Lights up. Take a ruler and divide a room into quarters. Divide the quarters into sixteenths. Call each, each sixteenth a work center. In each work center, place a desk and a chair. Place, place each desk in the exact center of the work center. At each desk, three pens, two black, one red. At each desk, one lined letter-sized notepad. Orient all the desks to face in the direction of the sun, where the sun would be at 9 a.m. Now, turn one quarter of the desks 90 degrees to the left. Leave a note on these desks. Haley, turn one quarter of the desks 90 degrees to the right. Leave a note on these desks. Greg, turn water, one quarter of the desks 180 degrees. Leave a note on these desks. Praline, lights out. Haley, Greg, and Praline, each times four, are sitting at their respective desks. Uh, at the other desks are the audience. Haley, Greg, can you come to my work center? Greg, I'm in a meeting. Haley, Praline, can you come to my work center? Praline, let me find a time. Haley, it's an emergency. Greg, what's going on? Haley, I'm in trouble with God. Praline, I'm in a meeting. Greg, it's an emergency. Haley, let me find a time. Praline, I'm in trouble with God. Greg, you're in trouble? Haley, you're in trouble? Praline, let me find a time. It's an emergency. I'm in a meeting. I'm in trouble with God. Everyone claps once. Repeat the above scene four times, rotating characters. At the end of the fourth rotation, Praline falls out of her chair and onto the floor. Six seconds pass. Haley and Greg fall out of their chairs and onto the floor. On the way to rehearsing this play, notice three people on their way to or from work. Draw them in the space below. Have every member of the cast and crew repeat this gesture every day on separate paper. These drawings are called the workforce. If anyone is late to rehearsal ever, put them in super isolation. Place them in the middle of the rehearsal area and ask them to put their head down and to think of something else. Rehearse around them, ignoring them completely. Make decisions without them. Continue like this for 15 full minutes. When they are released from super isolation, have them write a short paragraph about what they were thinking about during their time alone. Using only that text, compose a short scene with the whole group. It's not enough to know where you work. You also have to know how to get there. You have to know what to wear to work. Different jobs have different requirements. Some jobs require that you get training. Other jobs will train you on the job. It's important to know what kind of training a job might require. Does it require an advanced degree in materials science, for example, or not? Some jobs will compensate you for your commute to and from work. 
Other jobs will not. Some jobs will be near where you live, and other jobs will be across town or in another town. Sometimes you will be married or in a serious relationship with someone who has a job that is very far away from your job, and it will be difficult to figure out where to live. Or maybe then you can't live together anymore. Some workplaces are dangerous. It's important to know what you are getting yourself into. Some workplaces are dangerous. Sometimes people die on the job. They get trapped or crushed or murdered with an automatic weapon. Some workplaces are dangerous. Sometimes you get a repetitive stress injury or you suffer the long-term consequences of exposure to toxic chemicals or you put yourself in harm's way as part of the job description. Always request a job description. Know who to report to. Learn exactly how often you will be evaluated and the consequences of a negative evaluation. Lights on Haley and Peter. Haley, thanks for coming to my work center. Peter, no prob. Haley, I wanna show you a funny video. Peter, sweet. Haley, it's on the internet. Peter, awesome. Haley, it's loading. Hold on a sec. Peter, okay. Haley, you're gonna freak out. Peter, okay. Haley, you won't believe it. Peter, okay. Haley, here it goes. Peter, I can't wait. Repeat this scene with two Haley's and two Peters. Repeat this scene with four Haley's and four Peters. Every 10th audience member is a manager. Give them a wink when they enter and make sure to shake their hand extra hard. Secretly point out the managers to the cast. Make sure the cast acts extra hard for the managers. Don't let the managers know they are getting special treatment. <laughs> On the day of the performance, navigate to the business section of the New York Times website. Select every, every even numbered sentence from the top three articles and assign them numbers so that one is the second sentence from the first article, two is the second sentence from the second article, three is the second sentence from the third article, four is the fourth sentence from the first article, five is the fourth sentence from the second article, and six is the second sentence from the third article, and so on. Insert these sentences into the following scene. Greg, what? Praline, one. Greg, I'll write it down. Praline, legibly, please. Greg, yeah, okay. Praline, just copy it down. Greg, okay, I have two. Praline, I don't think that's right. Greg, that's what I heard. Praline, okay. Three. Greg, okay. Praline, okay. Greg, are they gonna want to? Praline, just write it down. Greg, speaking out loud as he writes, four. Praline, five. Greg, six beginning to speak over one another. Praline, seven. Greg, eight. Praline, nine. Greg, 10. Peter enters. Pause. Peter, this all needs to get reformatted for the website. Long pause. Overlapping completely, Greg struggles to keep up, his pen flying across the paper. Peter, five. Greg, two. Pauline, Praline, one. Peter, two. Greg, four. Peter, six. Praline, eight. Greg, five, Peter, four, Praline, five, Greg, four, Peter, five, Praline, four. Haley enters, pause, Haley, I'm in trouble with God. Haley exits, Greg, one. Begin every rehearsal and performance with a spoken pledge. Everything I will do today, I will do with my eyes open. I will do with my heart open. I will do with my mind open. Everything I will do today, I will try to remember for the future. When I think back on today and try to remember what the fuck happened on that particular day. Everything I will do today, I will do with the intention of separating this day out from a series of days that are more or less the same. The same way to work, the same feeling in my body, shaped by the onslaught of moments and tasks and sounds and feelings that don't make sense anymore, and I will promise myself that I will quit if things get too bad. Ask one quarter of the audience to look north, one quarter to look south, one quarter to look west, and one quarter to look east. Tell them, watch out. Tell them that their job is to watch out. Every desk has its own lamp. Tell them, watch out for the pattern of lights on the desks. That's the point of the show, the part where we change the pattern of lights on the desks. That's the art. It's not all the other part. It's just the lights on the desks. It's a light show. All the other stuff is just the stuff on the way to the work. All the actors and the costumes and the lines and the director and the tickets and even the desks. That's just the traffic lights and the trees and waiting for the bus, which is late this morning, slightly late, but not too late, or the minute spent defrosting the windshield or the coffee that's slightly colder than usual. It's a little different, but it's not that different. It's the way to work, but it's not work. But the lights on the desks, that's the work. We made it. The real work is about to begin. Just watch. 
Sliding into a meeting a few minutes late, Haley avoids the glance of her coworkers. She sits, holding a tablet computer, but it is not turned on. Haley glances at her coworkers and assesses them. Sliding into a meeting a few minutes late, Haley holds her tablet computer, but it is not turned on. Haley is assessed by her coworkers as she glances at them. Casting a glance across the faces of her coworkers, Haley looks down at her tablet computer, but it is not turned on. The meeting starts a few minutes late after Haley slides into her chair and avoids the glance of her coworkers and checks her tablet computer, which is not turned on. A tablet computer on her lap Haley looks up and encounters the blank gaze of her coworkers who do not notice her or her tablet computer, which is not turned on. Haley's blank gaze extends down toward her tablet computer, which is currently turned off, and then up and out towards her coworkers who assess each other as Haley slides into her seat late to the meeting. A few minutes late, Haley looks at each of her coworkers in turn, assessing them, then turns her gaze down towards her tablet computer, which is not turned on. The meeting starts a few minutes late after Haley's coworkers assess her and her tablet computer, which is not turned on. Haley's glance extends to each of her coworkers in turn, assessing them as they assess her tablet computer. Haley's glance is not returned by her coworkers, who begin the meeting a few minutes late after Haley slides into her chair and looks down at her tablet computer. Haley's tablet computer is propped up in her lap while she holds the gaze of her coworkers in turn prior to the start of the meeting, which begins a few minutes late. Haley's coworkers glance at one another and at Haley, assessing her. Haley sits down. Haley glances at her tablet computer, but it is not turned on. Sliding into a meeting a few minutes late, Haley sits down in her chair and glances at her coworkers, assessing them. Haley's coworkers assess her as she sits down late to a meeting, tablet computer in hand. The meeting begins. Haley glances at her coworkers. She assesses them. She glances down at her tablet computer. She turns it on. She looks up. In this play, intermission comes very early and then never again. Fifteen minutes into the play, it's intermission time. The audience is encouraged to use the bathroom. Actors can say things like, you should probably use the bathroom, it's intermission! That last part can be said with a lot of forced enthusiasm. Actors can also say things like, if you don't use the bathroom now and you need to go later, you'll feel stupid. If necessary, an additional enthusiastic, it's intermission, can be added here as well. Actors should remind the audience that this is the only intermission and they should enjoy it because there will never, ever, ever be another intermission. If they don't take advantage of it now, they may regret it later. We are not responsible for your regret. It's intermission is the kind of thing that the actors might want to say if they need to reinforce this idea with the audience. Some particularly savvy audience members will think that the intermission is a joke and that the play is going to keep going during the intermission. You might just keep an eye out for these audience members and tell them personally that they should really take the intermission seriously. Actors are encouraged to use the intermission to check their phones, email, Facebook, etc. By doing this, they can model a good use of the intermission for the audience, who will hopefully also use this time to check in on whatever notifications they might have missed during the last 15 minutes. During the intermission, audience members should be encouraged to engage in dialogue that evaluates the play. Actors should approach audience members and ask them how it's going. Here are some possible questions. What would you rate it so far, between one and five stars? Where is there room for improvement? What would you like to see happen with Haley? Who is your favorite actor in the show? How did you get here tonight? Is this play like your job, or is it only like our job, i.e. making plays? Seriously, rate it between one and five stars. I liked the part where we spoke in unison. What did you think? Et cetera, et cetera. Actors can also engage in other dialogue with the audience, like, I like your shirt. Who are you here with? Where are you going after this? Did you see the most recent episode of Popular Show? What do you think about the gentrification happening in local gentrifying neighborhood? How much money do you make? Okay, that's it, that's an excerpt. All right, thanks, that's my talk, thank you. Yeah, totally, I mean, yeah, why not? Let's have questions. <laughs> no question or comment. Um, I normally like to listen to an entrepreneur, and I haven't invited you to come here for the last four days, and I was amazed how long it takes to cross the town. The whole thing with the desk, just like I was right there, and all that frustration. <laughs> so built into it. And it just felt like, like the squares were getting smaller, and the desks were getting smaller, and the people were still there. Cool. Do you see this piece performed in a traditional theater space? Ideally, I mean, maybe, but like one of like like something like Shaking the Tree or something where it could be reconfigured into something that's 
like a workspace. I mean, the idea really is to make a workspace that the audience can be in, I think. But my, but my further idea is like, I'm going to generate all these procedures, and then I'm going to turn them over, and then I'm going to like let the director of the play decide what to do and what not to do. So part of the principle of this, of this collaboration is, um, how can I create a whole bunch of things that create structure and are interesting to me and might make interesting performance, but also not um, be like the ultimate author of the piece? So that it's still in a sort of collaborative dynamic. So I guess what I say is I don't know what will happen. But in my mind, like if I was doing it, yeah, I would like to have it be like a workspace that you come in. And so the whole thing is kind of like you've come in and you're going to work. That would be fun. But I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it would be totally different in any incarnation, yeah. Which makes it kind of the opposite of like LeWitt, right? So it's like, here are all these procedures, but actually they would generate something. Whatever gets generated, there's a lot of wiggle room, a lot. It's not really like executing a, a tightly controlled plan, yeah. It'd be really hard to memorize. That's the key thing I keep thinking about. It's so much text that I don't know if you actually could do it. That's the thing that I've been wondering about the news section. Um, would you have to just learn it for the beginning, you know, like a day the start of the show and then keep it? I don't know. Because it's a lot of stuff like choral. It's choral and in unison. So I don't know. It's a technical challenge. But yeah, I would imagine it would affect it a lot. I did it. I mean, I, I actually wrote it out the, the day that I made it. But I didn't read that because it's, it's too difficult to read with the, all the overlapping stuff. Yeah. I just, I think that listening to it and kind of my imagination of what it might be, the top three, um, would it not, if, I mean, recently our headlines have been pretty shaky, um, and how is that not going to take the star of the show? Take what? Like, the, take the main focus. Like, do you well, it's the business section, right? It's not like the front page. Right. So it's, it's business news. My, my ex so I mean, in terms of like the, 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 the top articles were about student loan debt and um, something about conservative radio, the business of conservative radio or something, uh, and how Donald Trump is playing on conservative radio, I think, and something, uh, what was the third one? I don't remember. But they weren't, they weren't like, it's a school shooting, and now this play is about a school shooting, if that's what you mean, like where the, like, the, the thing of the day overwhelms it. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it would be even better to like, date it back, like just be like, you have to pick this day last year, and pick not the top three, but like the fifth, sixth, and seventh article. I don't know. But you I tweak it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ideally, <laughs> ideally, ideally, I would walk away. In reality, I probably won't. Um, in because I, I've been working in a sort of dramaturgical capacity with them anyway, and I think that I would probably keep doing that. That's that's how we've discussed is that I would still be a resource in rehearsal. Um, and maybe it would be interesting to be generating new procedures based on the rehearsal process. That's another thing that could happen. And I don't know whether that will happen or not. Um, so probably more like that. Although I am really interested in this idea of making, a, making it almost more like a traditional play model, where like I've made a crazy pile. But really, you could just you could do a bunch of different things with it. And maybe even all the things that I've made here, are some of them are self-contradictory. And so I'm wondering, I mean, not in this but overall, I, there are other ones that I've made that, that you couldn't do all of them. And so inevitably, the author, the, that authorship is in question. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know. I am worried that if I'm in the room all the time that I'll just be like, <laughs> that I'll, you know. So another comment is, um, this is kind of like writing this well in a storm where the viewer, wherever this thing goes, 
however this is filled in, is going to do that for me. Well, what exactly happened to me? And how am I going to go home and say, like, okay, got it. Story, you know, this is Hamlet. We know what Yeah, going. yeah. I'm going to go. I got to, I'm going to talk about this in a few days because i got to digest this thing. It's yeah. It's really great because for me, that a lot of room for interpretation. So it influences them beyond them. It's like, okay, great entertainment. I'm adding to the book. Well, that was entertaining, but I don't know how to explain this when somebody says, I don't know. i got to think about this. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's what I see in the beauty of this kind of work. Yeah, I hope that it's still right. Because when things are really ambiguous, a lot of people turn off and really are like unhappy. And I hope that, uh, but I love ambiguity personally. So I, 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 I would hope that we could make something, and maybe you could hear this, that's also funny and entertaining and, and alive for people in the moment um, in a way that uh, maybe offsets the pain of, of of, the, of it being ambiguous. But I do think, for me, um, that's, I, I just can't imagine making work that isn't ambiguous. That's like my, that's where I start. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so yeah. I do have a question now. So if you could give me one or two words as what is the intent of the emotional field behind this that you want the viewer to get? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to decide. What, the, what it is. Um, but there are a lot of things that I'm putting into it, inevitably, right? Um, the inspiration for this piece is, is, so the whole season has to do with Melville, and the inspiration for this piece is Bartleby the Scrivener, who just stops working, right? This Melville story where Bartleby just would prefer not to. And so uh, I'm interested in um, what it would take to stop working. Uh, that's one thing I'm interested in. Um, but mostly, I guess, I'm interested in the textures, the unexplored textures of work. I mean, and it, you can't generalize about work, so I'm kind of talking about my work, really, in some sense. I mean, that's the research that I know is what it is to be in a meeting. And so this like long passage about sitting down to a meeting with these sort of almost Gertrude Steinian kind of variations is um, uh, derived from sitting in meetings, right? Um, so, so I don't know. Um, I'm really interested in this question also, just personally, uh, this question of um, when you do the same repetitive task over and over again and you try to remember it and you really can't, uh, I find that terrifying. And so that fear of like losing my life out of repetition is something that I'm, that I'm exploring, right? So, so repetition and variation, but, but the, what are the emotional stakes of that? You know, I mean, you always remember like the first week of a job or the first week of school or the first week of something, and then it sort of begins to slide together, right? You have so many meetings and they, you know, they're the same. I don't know, for me, so I'm worried about that. <laughs> so, so now you're hooking into like a production experience, you know, like a production line experience, for example. A repetitive task over and over again. Yeah. Uh, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. The same thing over and over all day long. Do you worry about not remembering parts of it ever? What I worry about is, the, you know, I don't worry about anything, but basically it's, it's, I've done it so long it's become almost automatic. Right. It's, it's like I'm, I, I occupy myself by trying not to think about what I'm doing. But then I, 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 I do it so well that I don't have to. So, so do you, what do you think about? Um, well, I'm, uh, I've got an iPhone. Yeah. And so in the mornings, I listen to a radical left talk radio on cable. Uh -huh. In the afternoons, I listen to uh, a selection from uh, like over 100 uh, uh, classic or, or some classic CDs. Right. And basically, I amuse myself uh, to divert myself from what I'm doing. Right, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's what production work is all about. Yeah, and I think a lot of jobs are about that. Even yeah, yeah. And so I mean, I, I I can see a connection with what what you're producing and what I do. Well, good. <laughs> I, I think right. I mean, um, yeah. I don't know. So much of life I mean, that's, that's, is is repetitive. I mean, exactly, I mean like most no matter jobs, what, even like a, a sales job or or a an office job, or yeah, is has that repetitive. You're doing the same thing over. That, that, that's the, that is, uh, encapsulates what, what much of our lives in this 
world we live in yeah. encompass. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like uh, we go to work and we do our job to the, to the best of our ability, but spend most of our time trying not to think about doing the job at all. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is, right? Yeah. Well, I hope it's not just to add to the ambiguity of the piece. That seems sort of capricious. Um, I, 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 I hate to like be like, this is what it means. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but I do think it reflects a certain kind of like panic. Mm -hmm. You know? There's an element of panic. You know? I used to, I mean, I used to work with somebody who was always just, it's like, oh, I gotta get good with God. I mean, this was like the main thing that he would say, like every day, right? And it was like, you know, he had been out drinking or something, and the next day, it's like, I got it. And there was this feeling of panic, like, when am I gonna get good with God? So that's another thing. There's like a, a stem from repetition in itself, too. So yeah. Sorry, now I'm just picking at it. But no, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't even know if that is actually what inspired the line, that story, but I just, you know, that's what occurred to me right now, so I don't know. Yeah. Is, there, is there something that sort of sparked this uh, sort of uh, trope, numeric pattern and algorithms through the, these plays? Well, I think it's really, it, it helps think, it helps us think, blah, 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 blah. I think it helps us think about repetition. So I think that, it, it, it's, it's, I, I think the impulse is actually slightly different in this play than in the other play. Uh, I think in the other play, the algorithm itself is an algorithm that's attempting to replicate like life patterns. And so the story is about um, this sort of mythos of the West. And I mean, it's sort of it's ridiculous, but it's this, you know, there are these forces that seem to be overtaking. And you know, who wins at the end is actually dependent on how the algorithms go. So there's this like, there are these different, there's you know, the cowboys and the dinosaurs, basically, right? Um, and it's indeterminate, um, and I like that. Uh, but in this piece, I think there's something about uh, any kind of repetitive work where, where procedures are already part of it, you know? Um, including like the procedures of making a play, but like the procedures of, you know, like how you get evaluated and all those things that are, I mean, those are also just like office procedures. So. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, is that answer, is that answer your question? Probably. I think it's interesting that you're, you're trying to bring so much ambiguity to something that has order, you know, in a sense. Oh yeah, but I mean, I think there's a lot of ambiguity in this piece too, right? I mean, there's something, there was a weird the experience of a, of a LeWitt piece can be actually really ambiguous, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. It's in, yeah, using the word mantra to describe our, our daily routines is really interesting. I, I think what you're saying is interesting. Yeah. No, I'll just go have some wine. That yeah. sounds great. <laughs> Thanks, so Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.